Alright, this video will focus on chapter 26, Africa and the Atlantic World. So between the 8th and 16th centuries, powerful kingdoms and imperial states ruled the savannas of Western Africa. You know, uh, with the Kingdom of Ghana being the first, the Mali Empire being in the, Mali Empire in the 14th century, and then the Songha Empire in the 15th century. Now, just FYI, all of these were based on the gold and salt trade. Uh, it's one of the most important figures in its history was a man named Sunni Ali. He established a system of, provin of provincial governors, an effective chain of military command, imperial navy, and an imperial navy to patrol the Niger River, and a profitable trans-Saharan traffic. And yeah. However, the musket musket-bearing Moroccan army managed to destroy Songhai forces in 1591. This caused the original citizens to rebel and exert local control. This was the last Saharan Gold Empire, um, as the maritime trade became le became more important and the land route over the Sahara Desert became irrelevant. The, the Swahili began to decline in East Africa due to the Portuguese. For example, Vasco da Gama skirmishes of Africans on the eastern coast from 1497 to 1498. He returns again in 1502 and forces Kilwa to pay tribute. 1505, Portuguese gunships dominate the Swahili ports, and the Swahili states never recovered their prominence in the Indian Ocean trade. The Kingdom of Congo was a strongly centralized iron producing state with a large bureaucracy by 1250 ish. It was, it was not exactly a great benevolent society, as it was quite extractive even before the Portuguese. They began relations to the Portuguese beginning in 1483, for, for even, even with. Going as far as King Nzinga Mamemba or Alfonso the First converting to Christianity, as they appealed to the rulers by reinforcing the power of monarchs, it was also a useful connection with Portuguese interests. Alfonso the First was a zealous convert who attempted to convert the population at large. So this is a map. This is a picture of the King of Congo meeting with European ambassadors. So already they were establishing relations before the before the slave trade kicked in. The Kingdom of Congo coordinated slave trade for the Portuguese, uh, as the, they discovered it was easier to trade trade weapons for slaves provided by African traders rather than grab them grab it themselves. This was, this was mainly due to the fact that the interior conditions of Africa were incredibly hostile to Europeans, as they had no effective counter to malaria. This they wouldn't Europeans themselves wouldn't be able to venture into the interior of Africa until like eighteen until the scramble for Africa because they had quinine to counter malaria. Uh, the Congo King's appeal filed success to slow down that slave trade, but slow down but not eliminate the slave trade. However, this doesn't help this doesn't help as relations deteriorate with the Portuguese attacking Congo and decapitating the king in sixteen sixty five. The Portuguese trade moved, moved down the coast of Angola because they wanted a more profitable region for trade. So, there it goes. So, in Angola, uh, the kingdom of Ndonga gained wealth and independence from Congo by means of the Portuguese slave trade. The Portuguese influence was resisted by Queen Nzinga. She was she's an interesting figure because of the fact that she posed as a male king with a male cross-dressing harem. Nzinga organized military resistance. She was largely successful in controlling Portugal's, controlling Portugal's expansion, but she was unable to kick them out completely. After she dies, her kingdom begins to fall apart and becomes the first European colony of sub Saharan Africa. In southern Africa, chieftains developed trade with the Swahili East, the East States, with, you know, with one of the major ones being Great Zimbabwe in 1500, dominating trade in the region. The Dutch built Cape Town in 1652, 1652 and became increasingly involved with South African politics. By the 1700s, large numbers of Dutch colonists were settling in South Africa and defeating local peoples. They encountered the Khoikhoi people, I'm probably pronouncing that terribly wrong, or Hottenots and enslaved them. British colonies also developed. Also, and, uh, and, and if you know anything about South African history, these British will... will uh, don't, will not really have great relations with the Dutch, who are who later become who are now known as Afrikaners. So this is a map of the various civilizations of the time. Uh, you know, Kingdom of Congo, Ndunga here, uh, it's the Songhai Empire, and the Kingdom of Kanem Bornu, as well as some of the Swahili city states here.
indigenous religions in sub-Saharan Africa are polytheistic, as they recognize numerous local gods as well as a single creator god. Paganism, Islam, and ancestor worship continue to be important despite efforts of Islam and Christianity. Islam developed the commercial centers, with Timbuktu becoming a major center of Islamic scholarship by the 16th, 16th century. African traditions and beliefs blend into Islam in a syncretic, new syncretic religion. They, as they saw no problem with female nudity and social activity. Fulana become extremely devout Muslims. They moved to impose strict adherence to Islamic norms in Africa. In 1680, they began military campaigns to enforce Sharia law in West Africa, basically jihadi states. They have a considerable interest in influence. They, they, their considerable influence also extends to the south as well. A person by the name of Donia Beatrice promotes a distinctly African version of Christianity. Stating that Jesus is a black man, Kong was the holy land, and heaven, and there was a heaven for Africans. Christian missionaries persuade King Pedro IV of Congo to burn her at the stake. However, the cult continued to exist after her death and demonstrates the African tendency to blend, blend new religions into their own faith framework. Early modern Africa, all the in, Af in terms of social changes in early modern Africa, although there was considerable nation building, kin kinship groups were still important. Trade of Europeans brings new goods to Africa as well as new crops from the Americas. Manioc slash cassava becomes an important staple staple bread because staple because bread flour because of staple bread flour because of the adaptation because the adaptation the adaption to soils was unsuitable for other crops. This increased the food supply, boosting the population. This this boosting population growth despite the slave trade. African food as the African foods American foods provided greater nourishment to the population. So this is a graph of the big media population growth in Africa. Fifteen hundred in fifteen hundred we have like thirty five million ish people going all the way to, you know, sixty million ish, you know, in by eighteen hundred. The foundation, the key link in the African Atlantic century world of the 15th and 19th century was the African slave trade. African slavery how, had existed long before, but it existed long before, um, uh, before Europeans came along, dealing with primarily war captains, criminals, outcasts, and debtors. However, it's distinct from Asian and European slave, slavery as Thus, the, the, as the human, as the amount of slaves you had to find your wealth, because they didn't really have a form of private property. Africans also purchased slaves in larger families, and the slaves could be assimilated to the kinship group where they could earn many mission and kinship rights. There's a dramatic expansion of the slave trade of Arab traders. You know, I remember that Basra was on revolt of the 800s. New slaves are acquired by raiding villages and selling them on the Swahili coast. This was supported by the local African governments. African trades, the African traders depended on the African infrastructure to maintain their supply. This would last in the 20th, 20th century with about 10 million slaves being traded over a thousand years. So this is a, uh, this is a, uh, this is basically you know, a picture depict depicting, um, you know, like the uh, a scene of the Arab Islamic slave tra slave trade. Now the Europeans, it was far more extensive. It was far more extensive. The Portuguese raided the West African coast in 1441 and take and 12 men. They were met a stiff resistance, forced to reconsider their methods and join a traditional slave trade network. African dealers were ready to provide slaves. In 1460, 500 slaves per year were sold to mine, work as miners, pot workers, and domestic servants in Spain and Portugal. By 1520, 2,000 per year were to work in, were sold to work in sugarcane plantations in the Americas after the test markets in the, in the Azores and the various Atlantic islands, as many of the Native Americans died from a disease. Also, they frequently escaped. Sugar plantation also it didn't help with the fact that sugar plantation required massive labor forces or a lot of replacements, in, in particularly in Brazil. So this is a picture depicting a, a artwork depicting slaves working in a mine. Uh, this is not very fun work, as you can see. It is backbreaking and horrible. The triangular trade uh, involved the Europeans manufacturing goods sent and sent especially guns and sent sending them to Africa. African slaves were purchased that were purchased were traded for these uh, 
finished goods and sent to the Americas, where they were, where they were would work on cash crops. These cash crops were purchased in the Americas and returned to Europe, which were often turned into finished goods. Ba you know, it particular, you know, basically, you can summarize all of guns, slaves, and rum. The transfer of slaves from the Africa to the Americas was the Middle Passage, which was under which was under horrific conditions, involving four to six weeks on a filthy crowd of hold, holds on sailing vessels. Mortality initially was very high, often percent eventually declined to five percent because the slave traders figured out this isn't good for my profits if they keep dying. The stole slave trade total slave traffic from the fifteenth to eighteenth centuries involved sixteen million Africans. One quarter of slaves perished in a voyage alone, so only twelve million reached the Americas. So this is a graph depicting the African slave exports per year. It just, as you can see, it's not much in the 16th century, but dramatically increased in the 18th century. The impact on the slave trade varied accordingly to society. Uh, as the as countries in in, in Central Africa, such as Rwanda, Bugunda, Maasai, and Turkana, were able to resist the slave trade because they were in the interior, they they benefit from the distance from slave ports on the western coast. Other societies benefit from the slave trade profit. Most of the Asante, Dahomey, and Oyo peoples built powerful kingdoms with the firearms that they obtained from the slave trade. In terms of social effects of the slave trade, total African population expands due to importation of American crops. Yet millions of captured Africans are removed from societies and deplete some regional populations. This results in distorted sex ratios. As a two thirds of the slaves are male and are between 14 to 45 years of age. This encouraged polygamy at work with women acting in traditionally male roles. The introduction of fire, in terms of political effects, the introduction of firearms greatly increased the violence of pre existing conflicts. As they wanted to, as with more weapons, they wanted to fight for more slaves. With more slaves, there was, uh, and, this, and, there, and with the demand for more slaves, there was more war. The Dohomey create, pe people created an army dedicated to slave trade. They also included a female regiment. Societies even made minor criminal offenses punishable slavery, punishable by slavery in order to keep up with European demand. This illustrates the potential of slavery to alter or even destroy the patterns of African politics and society. So this is a picture depicting the Dahomeys. African slaves, most slaves in the tropical and subtropical regions performed agricultural labor in the form of American cash crops. The first plantation being established in Hispaniola, 1516. Later, you get ones in Mexico, Brazil, the Caribbean, and the Americas. Sugar was a major cash crop, cash crop in the Caribbean and South America. Later, later um, it became one of tobacco, rice, indigo, cotton, and coffee. The plantations were especially heavily dependent on slave labor, with a stark racial division of labor. And this was relatively new in the world. So this is the graph depicting the destinations of African slaves. As we can see, most of them, were, like, as you can see, the North American slave trade was actually quite insignificant compared to the total. A third of them alone went to Brazil, 12% going to Central and South America, and, and over half going to the Caribbean. The reason why Brazil and the Caribbean did so much was because of the fact that the conditions were just so terrible that slaves just couldn't live long enough to survive, live to reproductive age, whereas in North America, it was somewhat it was just it was just decent enough the slaves could li live long enough to survive to make it to reproductive age i guess in the caribbean south america south america african populations are unable to maintain numbers from natural means thanks to malaria yellow fever and a brutal working condition sanitation and nutrition this creates a gender there's also a gender in there's also a gender imbalance and you need to constantly bring in slaves government grows less disease and a more normal sex ratio. Slave family, families were encouraged as prices rise in the 18th century. Now, slaves were trying to resist slavery by engaging in half-hearted work or sabotaging plantation equipment or work routines, or sometimes they would fight. This is how you get the maroon populations, raiding plantations for goods they could not supply themselves. Well, actually, yeah, they flock, they flee, raiding plantations for goods they could not supply themselves. Or they simply just, re they could also just revolt, as slaves outnumbered other members of society. Revolts were violent, but did not result in an end to slavery, however. There was only one successful slave revolt in the Dijingo Plantation in Haiti in French controlled Saint, Saint Domingue in 1793. It was renamed Haiti and established itself as a self governing republic in 1804. 
Elsewhere, the revolts were outgunned by Euro-American firepower. African-American culture was a blend of various other cultures. African language could persist when the numbers permitted, otherwise European languages adapted with African influence. This is like the Creole languages, which is a combination of African and European language. You can even still find the Gullah language in the Carolinas even today. Christian was adapted to overcome, to incorporate, to incorporate African traditions. They met slaves men in Paris, churches, and followed Christian rituals, but associated African deities with Christian saints. Was Voodoo, Santeria, and Kadumble. Twenty percent of the slaves were Muslim, but there's little trace of that left left around. African musical traditions persisted in presentation of life, among other among other things, as part of their way to resist. For example, being a call and response, you know, it often involved a call and response, drums and banjos, jazz, blues. And, and this influenced jazz, blues, soul, country, western rock and roll, rap, skiffle, reggae, and etc. With Liverpool being a center of trend, this is expected by Liverpool being, Liverpool could become a you know, major music hub because it was a center of the triangle trade. You also get, you also got the um, introduction of words like gumbo, gumbo, you also get like, you know, word influence like gumbo, uh, eh. you also get food influences like Food influences like gumbo, okra, and rice. The cause of abolition was stimulated by the American and French revolutions with their calls for equality and freedom. But of course, that, that freedom and equality wasn't extended to you know Africans or non-whites, especially. Uh, Alado Equiano, of he, a former slave, writes a, a best-selling autobiography, eloquently attacking the institution of slavery. Also, the economic cost of slavery increases as you need to keep spending more and more money to prevent rebellions. And it didn't help in the fact that by the 18th century, prices that in the 18th century the price of sugar falls, and the price of slave, slaves rise. So this becomes a very unprofitable business. Wage labor and slave factors become more cost effective than slave labor. Denmark abolished the slave trade in 1803, followed by Great Britain in 1807, United States in 1808, France in 1814, the Netherlands in 1817, and Spain in 1845. However, the possession of slaves remains legal. The clandestine tr slave trade continued until 1867. Emancipation of the slaves because of the British colonies in 1833, then the French in 1848, the US in 1865, and Brazil in 1888. However, Saudi Arabia and Angola continued to use slavery until the 1960s. However, slave, the slave trade still persists today with debt bondage, contract labor, sham adoptions, and servile marriages. Thank you very much for listening.